Hello, everyone. We are live here. I have a very, very wonderful guest on today. This is Stefan from uh, Sanity for Sweden. He has a YouTube channel as well. He speaks about issues of populism, uh, government, etc. And I really enjoy his content and I'm really happy to have him here. Please let me know out in the uh, chat if someone can just give me a thumbs up or an OK to let me know the video and audio are all right. And once I know that for sure, uh, we'll continue on. So basically, um, I'd like to first off say thank you to Stefan for coming on. I'm going to pass it over to him and he can introduce himself and just let us know what his channel is about and how he got started. Thank you, Kelly. Thanks for having me. It's a, it's an honor. I've been watching some of your work and uh, what you do in Canada. It's great to see. And I was watching you singing in Manchester. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, I started the channel uh, when the campaign started for Brexit, the referendum in the UK. I had two friends, very good friends in the UK, and uh, I was watching them debating, and I thought they were so angry, and the other guys were very angry. It was very uh, strong words that was used, and I became interested. I thought, why are they so upset, and what is this about? I never, I never liked the EU. I voted against Sweden becoming a member and I voted against Sweden joining the Euro project. So I never, I never liked it. But uh, as these discussions went on, I realized I didn't know very much about it. So uh, I started to study. And uh, I studied the EU website. And um, you know, read most of it, I think. There's a lot. But uh, as I was reading, I was starting to become pissed off and upset about what this was. And uh, then I got this uh, very strong urge to talk about it because uh, the Swedes in general didn't know. So, uh, and I wanted to talk, so I started the channel. That's basically what happened. Well, that's interesting because it seems like every time I interview um, a YouTuber who's doing this kind of work, they say something similar. It's often not people who are loud and obnoxious and love to fight or debate. Many of us are quite private. Uh, we enjoy calm you know, civil discussion. We enjoy our time at home. We might not enjoy conflict and fighting, and yet here we are saying, enough is enough, I'm frustrated, and everybody is so apathetic. I don't know if you get that impression in Sweden, but in Canada, that's been very frustrating for me as well. Um, the apathy, the Canadians that just don't want to learn, they don't care, and when you try to tell them, they are so afraid of being called a name like racist or, or intolerant that they won't speak about it. So I don't know, is that the same sort of environment and atmosphere in Sweden right now? Yeah, I would say, yes. And you're right, this is frustrating and uh, you know I, I just thought this information must get out and uh, I didn't want to sit around being grumpy you know and I had sort of had this was a very strong urge to, to talk basically and uh, I didn't know what was going to happen but I just started talking and then I got some feedback and uh, I got encouraged and so on. But yes, in Sweden, it's uh, actually there was an interview done by uh, uh, mainstream media recently about the EU. Uh, they were talking to people in the streets and they asked the people about who was the president for the EU Commission. This is Jean-Claude Juncker, right? But uh, of course, these people didn't know. And this is the situation. People just don't know. They think it's, well, it's pretty good or it's pretty bad, but they don't know how serious this is. This is actually an attempt to destroy Sweden's independence. 
Yeah, people, um, I find that with the UN as well, people assume, well, we all learned, you know, growing up in school here that it's this peacekeeper um, sort of community. This is a group of people we should trust. This is a group of people that are, are meant to cause world peace. And that's sort of something that I think people in Canada, um, maybe it's the same in Sweden, um, sort of think about the UN. Now we don't have an EU to deal with. You guys have that extra layer of bureaucracy. Um, it's a whole different frustration. But I know at least here for the UN, that's something people, people just trust them. People trust our national government as well. They'd rather trust the government and big government than trust their fellow citizens. They, they turn on their fellow conservative citizens, for example, but they trust, you know, the the pretty words that's, you know, I don't think they're very pretty, but the words that come out of Justin Trudeau's mouth. Um, and yet, you know, an average farmer or hardworking family man is considered, um, you know, taboo and the things he says shouldn't be shouldn't be spoke about. I find it's very frustrating because I feel like we've been led to believe in people that we don't even know. So for you, the EU is this far away group of people essentially that are ruling over smaller nations that should be, ha they should have their, their own say. I believe in small government. How do you rule over a, a smaller area if you don't know their concerns and their demographics? Um, overall, I mean, how much do you feel? I hear a lot about the UK, of course, like you said, with um, with Brexit. So um, with Sweden, do you, was there, the, I assume, like what, what were the numbers? What were the, the polling numbers for people in Sweden that were pro-Brexit or against it? Uh, how did how did it affect Sweden? Um, you know, over here in Canada, we just talk about the UK mostly. So, or we talk about, pardon me, um, like England mostly really. Uh, I didn't understand the question, I'm sorry. Uh, no, just uh, with Brexit. So when, when Brexit sort of happened, you said that's when your channel started. So I'm just wondering how it affects uh, Sweden specifically because Sweden, if I understand, is it part of the Brexit? Um, like, is it part of that whole that whole debate, that whole vote, or is it completely separate? Well, Sweden is not part of Brexit. Right. That's right. You guys don't have your own. You don't have your own form of trying to leave the EU. Oh Are no. You, okay. No party that's being formed to try to do the same thing. That's sort of what well, I mean. Well, th there is actually one party who is trying to do the same thing, and uh, there used to be another one. And this is the big nationalist party in Sweden that got about. 20%, 18% in the last election. And they said, we want a referendum and we want to leave the EU. And then they changed their minds because uh, this is what they say. They don't want Sweden to go through what the UK is going through. They don't want to put Sweden through this. But uh, then there is another party, a very small one, who is demanding a referendum and wants Sweden to leave. And the polls, uh, the opinions, the surveys that are done in Sweden shows basically that people are pretty happy with being part of the EU. They don't want to leave, basically. Uh, but if the question was, do you like the EU or uh, something like this, it would be different. I'm sure about this. Uh, and I think. I'm pretty sure about this. If we had a referendum in Sweden, the Swedes would vote to leave. Because we voted against the euro in Sweden. Okay, so that people, was my next question was about the euro. Yeah, we voted against it. And I'm proud of this. So the Swedes are uh, maybe a bit more aware than people give them credit for. Yeah, fair enough. Well, that's that's good to see um, that common sense and sanity, as you like to put in your uh, in your channel, is sometimes at the forefront. I did a bit of reading. I know you have what's called the moderate party, sort of a center right party. Is that one of the um, parties that you speak of that might be interested in leaving the EU? No, the moderate party, though, they are globalists. Uh, they are basically all there are eight parties in the Swedish parliament. And uh, seven of them are globalist parties yeah and then there is one <laughs> that sounds that sounds like canada we've got you know um it, it, there's not a lot of choice here or at least until the party that i'm involved uh, in came along the people's party of canada which i won't get into it's a whole other discussion but i know you spoke about maxim bernier um that's essentially why he started his party was there was just 
you know, the same three kind of four choices. It was, there was nothing for, for people who really wanted a different type of government. Um, I also noticed when I did some research that you have an interesting party called the Feminist Initiative that started back in 2005. And it looks like they actually got some ground uh, in 2014 and then they tanked in 2018. Do you have a lot of feminists and radical feminists in Sweden? I don't know, really, I don't. They are very loud. And, you know, Sweden is sort of known because of feminism and uh, the politicians in here in Sweden, they take pride in calling themselves feminists, you see. But the really radical ones, they are not doing too well these days. They crashed in the last election and they are crashing in this one, in the EU parliament election. They will not be able to send anyone to Brussels. So um, they're not doing too well. They have done some, well, I think the Swedes are getting fed up with them, basically. <laughs> yeah, that's what I think. But they get a lot of attention, you know, they are invited to these panel discussions and they are interviewed whenever there is a subject that is close to them, they are, they get to talk. So uh, it sounds like they are bigger than they are. Yeah. That's usually the case. Uh, the activist voices are the loudest voices and the you know the squeakiest wheels that get the grease, as we say here. Um, <laughs> yeah. It's unfortunate, but it's true. And it makes it seem like the whole society is is overladen with whatever um, whatever this issue is, and in fact, it's it's not really that bad. Um, we have the same issue here. Um, I don't consider myself a feminist. Um, I respect some feminists that maybe went before me years and years ago. Um, I'm very happy to live in a very free country, and I get annoyed when women in Canada push these constant uh, feminist narratives. And when it comes from Justin Trudeau, it's even more maddening, Steph. And I can't tell you how annoying he is to listen to. <laughs> gender 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 it's just it's just awful so i was just curious if that was common in sweden it sounds like you have the same problem <laughs> yeah we do i think yeah. i think justin trudeau is uh, amusing now some of my canadian viewers will tell me that he's not amusing at all but i find him hilarious actually he's like a I don't know what to call him. It's just funny to watch him, funny to listen to him. And you think, oh my God, this guy is running the country. And, uh, you know, I think he's the most, he's the corniest leader around these days. It's just, you know, there are so many good stories for me to talk about when it comes to Justin Trudeau. And he <laughs> the just, corniest he's... leader around. That's a perfect, yeah. it should be the, the Liberal Party's mantra. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, he sort of embraced the whole thing, right? The whole thing that we yeah. ha are having problems with. He just embraced it and he, he's going for it full blast. Well, so, and that's uh, just it is um, he's it's funny because you have to laugh or you'll you'll be too angry because it, 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 the, the truth is that he has a majority government and he's acting like such a dictator. And I think that um, we all expected him to be incompetent. Uh, we all thought, okay, he's he's really not doing a good job. He's he's botched everything from pipelines to even he's managed to lose money and have major issues with legalizing cannabis, which I don't even know how you can fail at, at selling cannabis in Canada. But he's managed to make major errors and and piss off people from all over the country and many people that voted for him. We all knew that, but he's dangerous too because he's this sort of puppet for a much larger um, agenda and he's really pushing through the legislation, pushing through bill after bill. Um, and we're really, really concerned about where he's moving forward with free speech and um, the way he speaks to Canadians and uh, shuts people down and and um, kind of a very narcissistic. It's, it's scary because he's got so much power right now. You know, the reason I think it's still funny is I think he's going to lose in the next election. Uh, if he was going to win, then, I, then this would be serious, of course. I wouldn't be laughing so much, but I know he's not doing well. And this makes it sort of interesting. It make, gives me hope for for us all, basically. You can't, you can't do this and get away with it. Yeah. So, 
Well, yeah. I think we when we first had our kind of our pre meeting before this live stream, because I think you said this is this is your first live stream, correct? Yeah. Excellent. Um, we talked a bit about I think the India trip, and I mean, you do have to sometimes sit back and chuckle a little bit and just make fun of him because some of the stuff he does is, it's it's comical, it's theatrical, um, and he really is just quite embarrassing when it all comes down to it. So he's both dangerous and embarrassing. It's an interesting combination. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah, not he should not be the leader of a of a G seven country, but that's uh, I think many of us know that here. So I'm hoping you're right, Stefan. I really am. I'm really hoping he um, he's out in October, and we will see what happens. But it, you know, the polls you can't trust anything because I, I don't know what your situation is with media in Sweden. But we have very similar to the BBC. We have what's called the CBC, um, and yeah. it's it's a state funded, you know, tax funded media that's generally quite biased in whatever direction the government that's uh, in power currently is going. So it's pretty obvious, it's pretty blatant, and it's very, very frustrating. And so it's very hard to trust articles. It's hard to trust polls. Um, they don't seem to really, when they call people to get you know answers, they don't really call certain people in certain areas. And then they, you know, they only, you say, go to an urban center, and then they wonder why all of their answers are, you know, is going in a certain direction and the rural people aren't represented, that sort of thing. So it's very hard to trust, but people say that he's doing well in the polls. I don't know how, I don't know anybody, even people that voted for him and are liberals, long life liberals that aren't going to vote for him. I don't think he's, I don't know. I just don't see it, but we'll, we'll find out. Yeah. Well, yeah, what well, your, your guy, Bernier, that's his name, Bernier? Yes, Maxime Bernier. Maxime Bernier. Uh, somebody said something about Maxim Bernier, you know, when he just started, and I looked at him, and you know, I immediately liked him, and this is for like a gut instinct uh, liking that I got for this guy. So I think he's very good. I hope he's doing. He will be doing well. It was about the same reaction I got when I first uh, listen to uh, Matteo Salvini of Italy, you know, just uh, when he opened his mouth, I just started to like him. So uh, I think he's a good guy. Well, I, uh, I've met him a couple of times now and I spoke with him on the phone. I did a parody song for him when he first broke off. He was a member of the Conservative Party of Canada and yeah. he, he put out some a series of tweets about multiculturalism and sort of radical multiculturalism and how diversity is being pushed in a certain way that maybe isn't positive. And he took a lot of he got the conversation going. He made people angry. He made people excited to see what he was saying. And it made his, the party leader quite upset. And so basically Bernier I don't know how long he'd been planning it, but he, um, you know, he he just essentially broke off. He would have been the party leader. Um, I think he lost by a couple of percent, something like that. But anyways, he um, he's very strong on certain ideals that you just can't say uh, when you're a, a member of sort of a mainstream party. Um, most leaders of the parties here, the, each MP, each member of parliament has to stick to a certain sort of prescribed party line. And it can be very hard on people who have certain ideals that they believe in. And he has a vision for Canada and love him or hate him. Um, many people hate him uh, for various reasons. The left hates him because they think he's a, a bigot and a xenophobe and a um, misogynist, which he's not. And then the uh, the Conservative Party hates him because we are now you know, splitting the vote. And of course we do want Trudeau out, which is a very big concern and I, I respect it. Um, so there's a lot of tension in Canada because right now the right in Canada has been split. And so we have sort of a little mini uh, war between the conservatives and then the liberals think we're all racist. And then there's the conspiracy theorists that think that I'm being paid by globalists. And um, if I am, I certainly haven't got the check yet. I'm not uh, exactly rolling in money. So I, uh, that's it's just ridiculous. The, there's all kinds of people that have many opinions, but he's gaining support. And now that we have candidates like myself, uh, we can represent and door knock across the country instead of just being on social media. So we'll see, uh, there's populist uprisings all over the world. I don't know how this is gonna go. We're gonna work as hard as we can, right? Yeah, well, I, reali I realized uh, some time ago what it takes for these guys like Bernie or Salvini or the Swedish guy running the Nationalist Party. Uh, it takes a lot of guts and they have to be strong like crazy, these guys, because they will be attacked, of course, uh, more than the others. The others are more safe, you know, the socialists and the 
the traditional conservatives, you know, because they have they have some sort of uh, safety around them. But these guys are out there in the open, so they need to be very powerful. These guys, in order to to survive, basically. So um, maybe he's got what it takes, Bernie. Yeah. yeah, he seems pretty. He seems pretty tough, and he's just going for it. He's just saying. He's saying what he believes, and and it definitely is stirring up the media. The media <laughs> hates him. Um, a lot of people think he's just so terrible because he's just not as as polite as so many. Um, but also, there's a, a large group of people, the silent majority, people like myself, who grew up in a rural community where um, you just want to joke and laugh, and everybody's nice to each other, and the community helps each other out, and you don't need to monitor everybody's speech all the time you just act like normal human beings. These people that don't want any more um, political correctness, you know, no more BS, um, just some sanity, just some common sense. Lots of Canadians are frustrated. And so Maxim Bernier does speak to those Canadians um, who just want to be able to, to continue, you know, living their normal lives because most of us are just regular, good, hardworking citizens. And instead now we're being called names. We're being um, sort of socially, uh, isolated, I guess you could say, and uh, Maxim Bernier is saying, no, that's not right. We have to have these discussions. So immigration, you know, he's even willing to talk about abortion. He won't make his uh, candidates, like, I don't have to, I have to believe in our party overall, but I don't have to have exactly the same opinion as Max. He will let me have my own freedom of belief and expression and thought. And I think that's really important. We need to do politics differently. So our party is about standing by what we say and not pandering you know, because in Canada, Trudeau and, and Scheer as well, they pander based on what the polls say. Oh, this group, we need more votes from this group. What can we give them? And it's not helping. No. Uh, yeah. Politics can be insane, really. Yeah. We have witnessed this, of course. So yes. that kind of leads me into what's going on in Sweden, which is um, it's good to talk about uh, Trudeau, although can only stomach him for so long. I'd like to talk about what's happening in your neck of the woods. Um, many of us here see and hear news stories and we hear rumors about things like, um, you know, violence and bombings and rapes and these sorts of things. We hear about um, sort of a, a migration crisis. But if we bring it up in Canada, we're often called conspiracy theorists or, or racists. And I want to talk to you about what's really going on, because I understand that this huge problem also caused you to actually uh, leave the city and move to a rural location. Um, so I assume it's pretty big. And um, I'm just wondering, I guess, I don't know where to start, but if you could touch on what sort of happened and when it started um, mass migration and how it's been affecting uh, Sweden, in your view. Well, uh... You know, I grew up in the 60s and the 70s, and Sweden was, I didn't realize it then, but Sweden was really a fantastic country to live in. And uh, I started to notice that there was a difference, maybe by the end of the 90s. Uh, and I started to feel awkward, uncomfortable, you might say, where I was living. And I always wanted to live in the country anyway, so. But uh, in my job, for instance, I, I used to go to certain places to do jobs. And uh, then there were areas where I couldn't go anymore because it, it wasn't safe, you see. And this is, uh, uh, this is a disaster, basically. People get used to it. And was, you know, but uh, I, I never did. I thought this was uh, terrible. And all, when the police can't go there without an escort, you know, you have a situation. We have these areas, these suburbs around Stockholm, where I used to live. Uh, it was becoming no-go zones. The police call them uh, troubled areas, you might say. So this has been going on. But it's not just uh, the bomb bombings and the shootings. I mean, it's, there's so much to it, you know, uh, shoplifting, drugs, uh, robberies in the streets, young kids are getting robbed in the streets. Uh, these things that happen and you, you get uh, the atmosphere, this is affecting the atmosphere and you start to feel it. 
So when I got the chance to sell my company and my house and my girlfriend wanted the same thing, we, we left Stockholm. And this was part of it, you know, the, this uh, uh, deterioration that I, I was witnessing. And I saw that Stockholm was about to become a shithole, basically. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, that's how it is. So I moved. Understandable. I think I would have probably done the same. I'm like you. I prefer the country. But especially if you start to feel that you can't be safe. Your home is supposed to be a sanctuary, a safe place, ideally. Um, and when you live in a supposedly free society, you shouldn't have to worry about the, the safety. But when you start to feel like you can't, when you're on edge all the time, right, you're stressed and nervous, it doesn't, it's not good for the body, it's not good for the soul. Um, so you were in this, you were in Malmo, is that like an area outside of um, Stockholm? Malmo is a different town. Malmo is the worst town in Sweden. It's in the in the south, Stockholm is the capital city. Uh, at the, in the e on the east coast, that's where I was living. I was not living in Malmo. Oh, okay, that was I was mistaken. I thought you were um, for some reason. I thought you had talked about Malmo um, or being in the city um, of Malmo or town. Well, I talk me. I talk a lot about Malmo mm -hmm. because uh, that's the worst place in Sweden now, and it's been for some time. It's been run by the socialists. Uh, forever, it seems, and it's not doing well at all. But Stockholm is about to go in the same direction. And you have areas in Stockholm where it's really, really bad. You know, I noticed also when I moved to this place, we have this little town close by. It's about 15 minutes by car. And I go there and I noticed, I feel... You know, when, when you watch girls uh, walking in the streets, you, I don't feel worried about them here. And this is making a difference to me. Because when I was living in Stockholm and I saw young girls, you know, 12, 13, 14 years old, uh, I was concerned, you know, will they make it home okay, you know? And these thoughts uh, influence you, of course in a negative way. So I feel much better here, but I'm still uh, concerned about Stockholm, of course, but I sort of left it, put a distance to it. So do you feel that the cities or some of the towns have been hit worse? Um, so like you said, the capital, of course, is, is starting to have a lot of problems. Um, where do you feel that has been hit the most um, by, by what's going on right now with the migrant crisis? Well, it is the big cities. There are three major cities in Stockholm, in Sweden. It's Stockholm, Gothenburg, and Malmö. And Malmö, as I said, is the worst. A uh, lot of violence, a lot of problems. Yes. So. Um, and uh, you. That's, uh, where, that's where it's happening. Ahead. But also in some some minor cities, uh, you're having some major problems as well. So it's spreading. Now, I've, I spoke with a, a gal from, she's a younger girl from Norway, uh, would have been a couple months ago. We just did a very casual uh, discussion about her visiting Canada. We talked about some geography stuff in Canada. And it somehow turned to the discussion of, of immigration uh, when it comes to places like Sweden and Norway. And she mentioned that there's quite a well-known rift between uh, the Swedes and the Nor like people from Norway who are... Um, I guess they have different views maybe on how they opened their borders. So my understanding is in general, Norway had a had a more strict sort of hold on their border, whereas Sweden sort of opened it up. And uh, maybe Norway is uh, feeling like the Swedes should have maybe not done that. And, and that, that's my understanding is there's a conflict. Can you comment on that? I've heard it from a few people from Norway. I'm not sure if it's true. Well, it is. It is true. Uh, our neighbors here in Scandinavia, Norway, Denmark, uh, they are concerned about what's happening in Sweden, especially Denmark, actually, because uh, there's just a bridge, you know, between Malmö, the troubled town, and the capital city of Denmark. And they are concerned about what's happening. You have the criminal gangs growing and expanding. 
So, of course, they will expand into Copenhagen, the capital city of Denmark. But also there is the, like, um, the debates are very different in Sweden compared to Norway and Denmark. It's, uh, we are getting there now, but for a very, very long time, there was no debate in Sweden. Uh, because people couldn't ask questions. Uh, they would get in problems if they spoke up uh, about mass immigration and things like this. Norway has been much, much healthier and Denmark too, absolutely. So they are doing better than Sweden. And Norway is not part of the EU. So, and I think this is making a difference too. You know, but they are they have a pretty good government in Norway. I don't I don't think they have it under control. But the Danish government, that's another thing. <laughs> yeah, I love them. You know, I used to say on my videos that we should borrow the Danish government for a day or so and uh, we would be OK. And I think it's a good idea because they are actually doing a good job in Denmark. They are actually trying to do something. You know, they have similar problems, but uh, they are much more active, much more sane, basically. The Swedish government is terrible. It sounds to me like um, Norway just had more, they were more proactive, they had more preventative measures. Um, and whereas you guys now, you're dealing with reactive you know measures you have to deal with what's happening after the fact whereas they sort of maybe thought ahead and thought maybe we should be very gentle and slow when this you know that they, they accepted my understanding is they accepted refugees but it was at a much more reasonable number and percentage is that correct this is true mm -hmm. yeah they got problems in uh, norway as well as far uh, as i understand it most of the refugees ended up very close to the capital city in norway and they have areas there where there's problems. They had problems with rape. Uh, there are female, this is what I heard some time ago, who uh, dye their hair black, you know, just to avoid harassments, not to be called a whore, things like this. So they have problems, absolutely. Sweden uh, hasn't learned uh so uh we opened the borders and they are basically still open the the government that we have right now is a left-wing government uh, influenced by the green party and uh, they just uh, they didn't learn so uh, we have to we have to uh, get a change here in sweden quickly um, there's a question in the chat. I was going to do questions later, just for everyone that's watching. Um, but this one ties into something I was curious about too. You mentioned that there are, you know, consequences or problems if people speak up. Um, Saint Jean, who's one of my long-standing subscribers, asks, "What kind of problems if they spoke up?" Many talk about Antifa being dangerous in Sweden uh, for a long time back. So, do you have Antifa in Sweden, and what sort of repercussions, both legal or social? Uh, happen to people who speak up, um, like you were saying, that are afraid to speak out? Well, if we go back a few years, you will see more of these examples. But I can just, uh, on top of my head, uh, think of there was a teacher uh, working in a school here in, Stock in Stockholm, and he uh, participated in the meeting with the Nationalist Party, and he was sacked. Uh, the students went to the principal, the principal sacked him. There was another one, uh, a writer, very well known in Sweden. He uh, uh, was part, I think he was at a dinner party together with the Nationalist Party or some of them. He immediately lost uh, many of his assignments you know, he was writing, he was a columnist, for instance. He just lost these jobs and uh, he went sort of broke. Yeah. And on a personal level, my, me, myself, when I started doing the videos, uh, I just uh, uh, got to know my girlfriend. 
and her family and friends reacted very strongly when they uh, heard about my videos and my girlfriend they started to discuss this or attack her because of this they didn't come to me so these things happen here Yes, so this is, you know, a lot of leftists that want to argue will say, oh, you're, you're still free to say whatever you like. You're not going to jail, therefore you're fine. But there is a social censorship that that's what you're speaking about. Jobs that are either lost or maybe you don't get a position. That's happened here in Canada. It happened to a guy in Kamloops. I'm having a moment. I can't remember his name, but he um, just made a few comments on social media. They were fairly benign. Uh, but they weren't new speak they weren't politically correct and he had been offered a job at the chamber of commerce and they fired him for it and then they wrote a, a an editorial in the paper and made it sound like it was his own fault and so you just get to the point where um people are this your the public your peers um your co-workers your friends your um, partners they're they're harassing people for having these views and they shame you um I don't know if you use this word, um, if it's more of a maybe an American style word, but there's a word called gaslighting and they talk about it in psychology. And it happened to me years ago in an abusive relationship with a man. And they basically are so smart and manipulative that they make you feel crazy. They make you doubt yourself. They make you think, well, maybe I am bad. Maybe this is my fault. And governments and the media are doing this on a large mass scale and very good empathetic people are believing it and listening. And um, I feel to me that's almost worse in some ways, that social censorship. If you don't feel like you can keep a job or a friendship, uh, you'll you'll sometimes just stay quiet, right? And I, I see that here too. Um, you, you did Was she able to rectify? Was your girlfriend able to rectify or have any, um, or has she lost friends and family or are they kind of finding a way to accept her views and your channel? Well, th there's still a problem, yeah. That was really bad. You know, I actually considered stop, stopping doing the videos because uh, my girlfriend, you know, she was uh, very concerned about this. That yeah, was bad for a while, and it still is. And these people who um, badmouth me to her, uh, I don't have any contact with these guys these days. So we still have a, an issue. Yeah, it's interesting to look back at this at this time because, you know, about Trump, for instance, when and there was a campaign in in the U.S. for the election, and I looked at Hillary Clinton, and I thought, I'm only, you know, she can't become the president. This was like the gut reaction that I got. She can't become the president. I just thought this is a dangerous woman. That's what I thought. And then Trump came along and I thought, yeah, I like this guy. And I said this, you see, there was a big, huge campaign in Sweden, in media. Nobody could ever like Trump. It was impossible. And I remember this I was at a party and something came up and I said, you know, I kind of like the guy, you know. You know, the reaction was uh, priceless. It was like dead silence. And some somebody laughed. Yeah, you get crazy. that here too. They laugh or they say, you, you like him? <laughs> Why? And they can't fathom it because the, our media also is just saying terrible things. If you tell them, oh, actually, he did a, something really good or there's a good policy and they just can't believe it. So it's... <laughs> no. That's right. It's funny, isn't it? It is. Yeah. Well, and now here, I believe people that wear mega hats, make America great again hats, they're being harassed and called bigots and racist because people believe that the mega hat is the same as the Ku Klux Klan hood. <laughs> That's what people believe, Stefan, isn't it? Like you used to talk about insanity. I don't even know what to say about that. Right. But uh, we're getting our revenge, you know, because the information about the success of Trump is starting to come out even media here in Sweden are starting to, t to report about it. You know, he's doing very well and the US is doing very well. So actually friends of mine, maybe some of them were at the party. They are starting to, all right, you know, 
maybe he was right after all. So you can gloat a little. Oh, oh, I wouldn't gloat. Okay, maybe just a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I love gloating. That's. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny because you just have to be patient with people because most people, if you're close to them and if they trust you, will listen. Um, not always. I've certainly I've lost friends myself. Um, you know, 65 years. My mom knew someone. You know, since she was a toddler, and she, she basically just left our whole family as a friend because I support Tommy Robinson and my mom wouldn't denounce that. And because she believes Tommy Robinson is a fascist, she now believes that I am a fascist. But much like your girlfriend's family and friends, they would not approach me. They just attack online or attack someone near me. They don't have the courage to come to my face and have a discussion because if you could have a discussion like we're having right now, they might consider it differently, but no one wants to because they want to be right. They don't want to have the truth they want to be right it's it's very frustrating um so thankfully now with truth and be, being you know spread around on the internet you have to dig for it lots of lies in there but at least we have access to the truth and people are waking up i woke up i was a leftist um in the chat there's a, a girl named gracie embarrassing mom she goes by she has a great channel uh, for any of you out there watching she left the democratic party in the states and she used to think that hillary should win and the night that hillary won she was horrified because she thought all these bad things about Trump. And now she's got a mega hat. She can't wear it because she lives in Portland and she'll be <laughs> murdered. But yes, she does have one. She's so. got it. <laughs> yeah, Beautiful. so lots of people are speaking up and you just have to be courageous, I guess. More people are thinking this than, you know, than not, right? Mm. It takes some courage, actually. Yeah. Well, no, you, I, I you get I a lot of really, hate, right? Yeah, I do. Uh, you know, I never really cared about people's uh, political opinions in the past and i still really don't you know i'm i'm just uh, concerned that the information should be available to them yeah and i think maybe some of them are just afraid when they won't talk to you uh, they are afraid that maybe they will too become a racist or maybe they too will lose friends you know they are afraid of these things yeah i think so yeah i think i think you're correct it's it's fear uh, people people want to be cared for and loved and accepted that's universal whatever race or culture we come from we want family and love and, and relationships and friendships so people are afraid of losing and it is it is hard um I'm not going to pretend that I didn't care when I lost. I've lost a few friends. Um, it, it hurts. It's not fun. I can handle strangers when they, you know, I get sworn at and called names all the time, especially now that I'm in politics. But that doesn't bother me. It's more when you have people that you thought knew who you were. But ultimately, you just keep moving on. You dust yourself off and you get up. And I've met so many other fantastic people and had these great conversations with people like yourself, other uh, content creators. And you start to realize that you're not alone. And then you don't feel quite as scared, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it was a good win for me, too. When I started to get friends online, viewers, you know, brilliant, good people. Yeah, I really like these guys. Yeah, that was actually one thing I had wrote down was just to uh, mention, I think quite a few of your uh, viewers came over to my channel after. So um, I'm noticing very, very strong similarities between our viewers and how they speak. And I, I have learned so much from, I, I think I have some of the best viewers out there. I'm biased, but they're smart, like you said, intelligent, and they think deeply about things and they make me think and they make me realize I've made mistakes. And um, I have to sometimes admit I've done something wrong or said something stupid, right? And uh, they're just really fantastic. They keep me honest and they're supportive. Um, I, I feel very blessed. It's like a big extended family on this channel. So. Well, that's great. Well, I have the exact same experience, you know, yeah. these guys, they are funny. Many of them are so funny. When I read the comments, you know, I, I just sit out, I just laugh out loud. And my girlfriend comes along and says, you know, what was that? It was a comment. Yeah. You know, and uh, so smart, some of them. And, uh, you know, educated. And they have, they many of them do research. Uh, you know, so I get a lot of information, a lot of I learned so much from uh, reading the comments. Yeah, it's brilliant. 
Yeah, I agree. I probably spend a lot of my time. I, I do a lot of conversation, but I had to stop more and more as my channel grows. It gets hard to answer everyone. But I read I read all of them, even the mean ones, because sometimes the mean ones are the most fun. Just people are <laughs> people really go for it, don't they, Stefan? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> I like to, to keep it as a sense of humor. Um, I know my, my fiance doesn't like hearing me getting slammed in the news or whatever, but I, I've just stopped caring. It, it, you really get used to it. I don't think it's just whatever. Like mosquito bites, you don't even notice, right? Yeah, right. Well, I have a bit, a little bit a different approach to this. You know, I see this uh, channel, the comment section is like, it's like my living room. You know, and uh, I want to enjoy it myself. So uh, I do kick people out. I do the very that's, rude. That's fair. Uh, it's your home, kind of, right? Yeah, yeah. The very, very rude ones. You know, the real trolls. Mm. Uh, the I've real, blocked a couple you know, of trolls. Yeah, I had to. You know, the people. Someone once made six brand new accounts to keep coming back. I'd block them, and then they'd make a new account and come back, and really <laughs> just wasting their own time. So yeah, those people. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I want to speak. I want to uh, get the feedback. You know, but I also want to enjoy it. If I don't enjoy it, I will eventually just stop, right? And I don't want to stop. So. So uh, that's what I do. And if you don't mind me asking, it's a personal question. You don't have to answer, but just because of the, um, the the things you mentioned earlier with your girlfriend and sort of the conflict that's come up because of your channel and politics, do you find that it's a bit of a strain on the relationship? Because I find for myself, it's been good because my fiance and I are on this political journey together. He agrees with me. We're growing and learning together. And he's very supportive. He's he's just glad to see me. I was very sick for a long time, Stefan. I had an illness for years. And so I was very thin a couple of years ago. I'd lost a lot of weight and I just wasn't doing well emotionally or physically. So now he sees me alive and, and free and happy and doing something I'm passionate about and fighting for my country. So he's very happy for me. But there are times when, you know, because it's affecting even his friendships, they're kind of more left leaning. And now he mentions something about the Tommy Robinson trip, and then they go kind of silent. And now suddenly they're not texting or calling anymore. And, you know, I think those things do, it, it's a bound to affect your family, even if you try really hard not to, right? Is, does she do pretty well with that? Um, how does how has that been for you? Well, she's, uh sad about me not having any contact with her folks uh, yes she is i have contact with a few of them who never attacked me basically so she's sad about this and yeah i think it is affecting my girlfriend i'm sorry about this and you know as i said there was a time when i thought maybe i shouldn't do these videos and i actually stopped doing them but then I felt just awful. So I did them again. I, I started doing them again. Uh, we do have discussions, of course, because she's got she gets information from her channels, from her friends. And we do have discussions about Trump, uh, about uh, anything like this. So. Uh, but we are doing very well. We are very good at listening. <laughs> yeah. But that uh, is she's the key. A, she's a brilliant, she's a brilliant lady. Fantastic. And we're doing well. But I think she came to a point where she had to choose. You know. Yeah, it's a tough one because, like you said, you can quit, but then there's this empty part of you because you start, I, when I started my channel, it was last July. It's coming coming along pretty quickly. Um, I, I didn't expect it to turn into all of this, um, going to England and all of that kind of stuff or getting into politics. It was just a way to, I was constantly ranting and having these vent sessions with um, with Steve, with my fiance. And I figured, okay, maybe I should, should speak out. And it was actually a Steven Crowder monologue. He was speaking uh, to a group of students and a young man came to the stage and he said, you know, what do I do bringing a child into this world? As a conservative, we're getting persecuted. Why would I bring a child into this world? I'm afraid. And Stephen Crowder, who's normally very, he makes a lot of immature type jokes, but he got really serious. And he basically said, 
you know, you really do have to have no fear. I recommend anyone looking at it. He'll do such a better job than I'm going to butcher it. But it's about six minutes. Um, I think it's just Crowder No Fear speech. And it just talks about stepping forward and speaking no matter what. It's really powerful. And that's what got me to do my very first video. It was so terrible in quality. I've deleted it since then. But um, I just kept coming on and, and turning on the, the cell phone at the time. I didn't have lighting. I didn't have a good computer. And people seem to want to listen. So you continue on because even though it's stressful, there's been days I've wanted to quit, but I, but then what, then what do you do? Right? Like I would feel like I let myself down. I don't know if that, if you can relate to that. Yeah, I can. I think this is a road that you sort of have to go th all the way. Uh, I, I can't think of moving away from it. You just have to go. No, I wouldn't feel complete or, or I wouldn't feel good if I just stop doing it. Yeah. And it's a, uh, uh, you get the rewards, you do. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. That's with anything in life, I believe. Um, you know, people like to numb themselves to pain and uncomfortable things, uncomfortable conversations. But with with all of those uncomfortable sensations, whether it's pain and physical sensations or or just um, emotional stuff comes, you know, if you have that intensity, you also get to enjoy the other side, which is joy, right? And, and passion and all of these things. So if you, if you are numb to all, you, you kind of have people shut down. I feel like people have shut down their hearts and they're like robots you know, and they only speak out when it's to be emotionally reactive. But what I try to do on my channel is balance head, heart, and gut. I believe that if you don't, someone gave me wisdom once, and I've always followed that. If you don't have a balance of thought, feeling, and instinct, something's bound to go wrong. So many people live in one or the other, and I find it hard to um, to navigate hard discussions if you're that um, stuck, I guess, in one method, right? Right. Well, it's very good. We have a very similar view on this. It's a personal thing. You just have to do it. Uh, yeah. And, you know, I, I don't want, I did a video a long time ago where, addressed to my grandson i got a grandson uh, and i told him i just wanted you to know that i was not here doing nothing looking at sweden going downhill i actually did something so and i think there's some truth to this uh, for myself i don't i don't want to uh, end this life thinking that i didn't do anything about it yeah, I'm the same way. Um, once I'm committed to something, I'm, I'm very, I don't, I don't quit. I'm very stubborn, and so if I believe in something, I'm very loyal to it. You know, um, and then as soon as the, but as soon as it's no longer right in my conscience, then I'm, I'm done. So yeah, this is something where I feel like I'm on the right side of history. So I, I keep going, and it's been really quite an incredible journey. I didn't expect to do almost any of this. So it, it's funny looking back two years ago um, to you know being such a bad place, not even really wanting to be alive. I was in so much pain, I was just suffering. And to come back around and say, no, you know what, I'm gonna, I was Jordan Peterson that helped me kind of dive out of that, you know, bear my suffering and uh, be the best person I can be. And that's sort of what I'm trying to do now. And it's amazing how much um, kind of personal power that gives you that sense of um, empowerment, I guess you could say, where you actually feel like you're trying your best. That's all you can do. We all have a gift. That's why I always say to my viewers, if you guys have any kind of a gift, musical, speaking, writing, um, making memes, it doesn't matter. Speak out, use, like don't, don't doubt yourself. All of us have something to offer. And the, the trick is just taking one little baby step forward at a time, right? Because it can be very intimidating otherwise. It's a beautiful story that you have, I think. It's a fantastic thing that you did. You got yourself out of there and uh, into the light. It was very good. Yeah. I appreciate that. And that's something I want to do on this channel is talk about some personal stuff. So what I'm going to do, because we already are almost at the hour mark that went very quickly. Um, yeah. I'd like to uh, leave it up to the chat. If anybody wants to get a couple of questions going, I've got one or two sitting here. And I'd like to ask you just a couple of sort of lighter questions. Um, we didn't get into um, maybe maybe the, the chat will bring up some other topics, but I ju I'm just curious about some things. So first, we do have a question from Zedmo. Where is your Team Canada jersey? He says. <laughs> I don't have any. You can send me one. Team Canada. Yeah. 
I know Sweden and Canada will probably meet in the final in the Hockey World Cup. Maybe, or maybe Russia will be there. But uh, I love these games between Sweden and Canada. Yeah, the the friendly friendly rivalry, I guess you could say. Are you are you a sports fan or? Not really. No, I like to watch hockey. You know, but uh, not really. I got other interests now. So there's a couple other questions. There's a sort of couple political questions. I, I want to ask personally, you live on a farm now. I noticed um, when you're inside, there's a lot of beautiful art around you. And I noticed the background of your cover photo on your channel is a, is beautiful art. And there's something about the way you speak that, like I said, it's a bit deeper. And I would like for you to describe to us one of the nicest moments, you know, those moments where everything in your senses lines up, it smells nice, it looks nice, you feel nice. I'd like you to describe, to describe something on your farm, a moment, maybe a, a sunset, something with the animals you've seen. There's just, there's something about the way you speak, Stefan, and I'm sure people in the audience agree. Um, you're a joy to listen to, and I would like to just hear some expressive speak about your uh, your current situation on your farm because you look very comfortable there. My first video I saw of you is just sitting in that barn and it's such a simple background. Um, I came out of my studio and, and my fiance was watching you and I sat down and we just I immediately subscribed. It was just such a nice thing to listen to you. So I'd love to hear your just your thoughts on where you live and, and sort of some of the beauty that surrounds you right now. Yeah, it's uh, it's fantastic to live here. You know, when I get up in the morning, I get up quite early these days and I have breakfast, I um, I can't wait to get out. That's how it is. It's such a beautiful place uh, that we moved to. Yeah, it's great. Uh, you know, I just love it here. That's how it is. Uh, when I got here, the first week, I was working way too hard. And I... I didn't do a video for about two weeks, I think. But then I thought I have to do a video and I did. And then many, many of the viewers said, you look exhausted. <laughs> and I, I didn't realize this myself. I had been working. I would I've been pushing this body so, so hard, you know, just trying to get everything in order. So, uh, I started to slow down. You know, these viewers, they take care of you, don't they? They look out for you. Yeah. That's true. Well, I've had viewers say to me, are you sure you're going to be okay? You're taking on too much. Slow down. We'll be here when you're back. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And wear a hat. You know, they see that I got sunburned and everything like this. You know, and one of the moments that I really love, I do paint. The artwork that you have been seeing, it's mine. And that's the probably the thing that I love the most is to paint. Uh, I've been painting since uh, 1996, and uh, well, it's the best thing, painting here outside. And I'm just starting this again, so uh, I'm uh, looking forward to this a lot. You know, when I paint, I feel uh, totally relaxed and. Uh, it's just a great feeling. So that is your art. I was wondering. That's that's fantastic. It's beautiful. Um, I always Thank I can't you. draw at all. I'm a musician, but I cannot draw. So I always respect that. Um, you really have to. So many people think conservatives aren't creative. I think that's that's just completely silly. Um, but that's there are most like leftist artists, I guess, that are well yeah. known. But yeah, exactly. That's ridiculous. So I feel the mm. same way when I sing. Um, you get into sort of a moment where you're. The time is just passing quickly and you're just, everything's flowing, right? It's, it's really it's really peaceful. And I think that's something, I'm so busy with my campaign. I have to make sure to make time for music, right? I did a hymn on Sunday and I had to make time for it because otherwise you get busy and suddenly you stop, suddenly you stop doing the thing that you love. It's crazy. Humans are, we're strange that way. Yeah. I just want to correct you on one thing. Go ahead. I'm sure you, I'm sure you can paint. <laughs> Are you sure about that? I don't know. Yes, I am. <laughs> I'm totally sure about it. Okay, just, well, perhaps if you I'll just, try it. If you just learn some very basic things, maybe three or four basic rules, you would be able to make some great things. I'm sure about it. 
all right, well, I'll take your word on it. Perhaps I'll have to go to, they have, um, you know, little painting nights and stuff here. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll have to go to one and, and try it out. I'm a perfectionist, so it's going to be tough. <laughs> well, that's tough. Perfectionists don't make uh, good painters. Well, some in the past, you know, Rembrandt and these guys, Rubens, perfectionists. Yes, true enough, but true enough. Well, it makes it interesting for piano too, because um, I actually, I did study some technical piano. I studied, I have my grade eight uh, with what's called the Royal Conservatory of Music. I don't know what you have in Sweden. So I learned, you know, Beethoven and Bach and, um, you know, I learned romantic period and some theory and all of that, but I, I didn't really love um, music and playing. I have very small hands, um, something maybe many people don't realize when you study music. Uh, Old, old fashioned pianists. I always say that as carefully as possible uh, because that's a word that people like to joke about. Um, Beethoven and um, uh, Chopin in particular, some of my favorite artists had massive long fingers and I can barely reach uh, a lot of them. So I, I often actually struggle with technical music, but I learned how to play off of guitar chords when I was about 15 at church uh, in, a, in a worship team. And I started to learn to play they called it playing in the spirit. I would just say playing um, impromptu, sort of um, learning chords and then just working within those structures. And so I've been doing that for about 18 years and it's much more enjoyable. I just let it flow. Um, actually, that brings me to my next question, which was from Kel Fritzi, another one of my viewers and yours, I think. Um, do you have any Islamic, or pardon me, this is the wrong question. Hold on a second. Oh, the one from Saint, Saint John. Um, do you have a belief in God or are you a Christian? She was just curious. Well, I'm not a Christian. Uh, I call myself a reincarnationist. Yeah. So I, I believe that there was a guy called Jesus. You know, and it, it, that he was a great guy. That I do believe. But I'm basically a reincarnationist. I had an experience when I was a little boy. Uh, I was uh, five years old. And I was watching my body from above. And uh, I asked my mother about it. I thought parents, they know everything. So, But nobody could tell me what was going on. And this happened while I was young, up until I was about 11 years old. This happened regularly. Maybe, you know, every second month or something. I could see my body from above. And uh, ever since then, I... I started to look for answers. What is this? Why, if if my body is there, who am I? You know these questions, and I concluded that we have lived before, and that we continue to live. This is my uh, belief. So you, yeah, you sound like a spiritual person. You have a, a deeper belief, anyway. Um, I was just curious. I think. I know you've mentioned and discussed sort of the rights of Christians. I find that's very common right now. Even people like I'm a Christian. I left my faith for years. Um, I studied sort of other religions. I looked into some different um, new ageist type stuff. That's a whole different topic. But I did come back to my faith. And what I've noticed is that just with what's going on, um, especially with uh, like radical Islam and terrorist attacks across the world. And when you do look statistically, Christians are, you know, the most persecuted group in the world. And there's numbers of deaths that are going on around the world that nobody cares about. And I know you spoke about that. So I want to say thank you because I always do. Uh, to, there's a lot of atheists and agnostics in Canada that they're not Christians, um, but they believe that there is an importance in maintaining Christianity and protecting Christianity. So I, I always like to thank people that are not of the faith that still stand up for the faith. So thank you for doing that, Stefan. Well, you're welcome. Yeah. You know, I, I can also recognize that the Christian cultures are uh doing well in general mm -hmm. i mean and i grew up in a christian culture uh so and i like the christians you know i get i have good conversations with them there are some things that christianity or the church's organized religion did and they are still doing it that i really hate so I wouldn't be a church member in any form. So, uh, but uh, I, I like the people. 
Well, humans have a really good knack of destroying good things. We like we can we can make a mess of something good, whether it's a country or a religion or an ideology. Um, you know, if you were to act like Jesus act, as every Christian really truly act like Jesus, it would be you know pretty incredible. Unfortunately, yeah. there's always bad people in every group that ruin it for the rest of us. Isn't that true? <laughs> it is true. Yeah. So that does sort of now now to get back to the question, since I was a little off on my order here. One more uh, question from the chat from uh, Kel Fritzi. Islamic parties. Do you have any Islamic parties uh, in in Sweden? We actually have a, a new one. It's not in Canada. It's just in Ontario. It's called um, I think it's the Islamic Party of Ontario, I believe is what it's called. And uh, it's not very serious. It's not very big, but they do have some very, very fundamentalist, interesting policies uh, that are quite eye opening. I'm just curious, do you have anything like that that you're aware of in, uh, in Sweden? That's what Kel Fritzi wants to know. We actually don't. We don't have an Islamic party in Sweden. Uh, we had for a while. There was a party started and they wanted to participate in the election in the last election. But something happened and uh, they never got the papers in order or something. Uh, so it was never established. But I'm sure there's going to be one quite soon. I think about 8% of the Swedish population is now Muslim. So, of course, you will see uh, a party starting quite soon. And this one isn't a question from the chat, it's just another one from me um, that I kind of wanted to fit in earlier. You mentioned um, issues with rising violence, of course, rapes, etc. And I think we all in the chat are maybe understanding when you say sort of the people that are, are perpetrating this, is it generally uh, members of the Muslim community that you find are, are causing a lot of these crimes statistically, or is it more of like the native population there? Well, there are there is research done and there are statistic reports and they show conclusively an overrepresentation uh, in the crime statistics uh, with people from the Middle East and North Africa. So you make your own conclusions from this. Yeah, fair enough. So they tell you that the uh, areas in which they come from, which of course are often, yes, I suppose, Muslim majority countries, but they don't necessarily speak of it because it's, they don't correlate it to the religion itself. I noticed that in Canada, if someone is of the Islamic faith and then is charged with, for, for example, you know, we have people that we know by their name or where they're from, that there's they're most likely of the Muslim faith and then something comes up, but the media doesn't ever want to link the two. So you never get to definitively prove that it was um, Islamic terror, for example, or if it was just someone with mental health issues, right? So there's a lot of people aren't even allowed to infer that these things happen here because then people just assume that you're, um, you know, xenophobic or Islamophobic. Um, did you get that word Islamophobic? Is that thrown around in Sweden a lot? Do you get that thrown at you as well? Uh, not me personally, not really. Uh, I prefer talking about people, actually. You know, I don't want to group people, really. I don't, uh, if I can avoid it. I often do, anyway. But <laughs> No, I don't hear this myself very much. Racist, I hear, of course. Uh, xenophobic. Xenophobic is probably the most used word here in Sweden when you want to uh, put somebody in place you use the word xenophobe or racist. That's a common one here too. Um, although here in Canada, we have what's called M103, which isn't a hard law. It's what I would call a soft law that will probably become law um, in particular after what happened in Christchurch. But it's, you know, um, basically the Islamophobia motion. So there's money and research taking place now from the government into online activities and, and criti you know, criticism of the ideology of, of Islam and that kind of thing. So we hear that term here a lot, um, particularly from Trudeau um, and all of his fine government officials. But we hear, yeah, racist and, and xenophobe are probably the two most, I'd say, buzzwords in Canada right now. But there's, there's lots of them. Um, I, I actually don't think I've been called, you know, I don't think I've been called an Islamophobe yet. Uh, that's bound to happen soon. My party has been called Islamophobic. I think that might be the one insult, Stefan, that I haven't actually heard yet. I think I've had every other one on earth. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you can check the, the last one off, Islamophobe. I'll let, I'll let you know when it happens, and uh, then I'll have all of them, I guess. So, um, 
There's one more question here. This one's more of a personal one from Julia B. 1955. She asks, Stefan, have you read Journey of Souls by Dr. Michael Newton? You can hear a great reading of the audiobook on YouTube. I'm also a reincarnationist and after one uh, OBE, OBE knew that we were not our bodies. Yeah, out of body experience. Yeah, so Journey Maybe. of Souls by Dr. Michael Newton is the one she's wondering about. No, I, I never read this one. Okay. No. I did read a lot about this when I was about 14, 16 years old, because I really desperately wanted some answers. There was nobody in my uh, surroundings that could give me answers to this. Teachers, parents, you know, friends, nobody would know. So I was looking for these books and I did read a lot of them uh, at this time. I remember one in particular by Jack London, actually. Uh, I don't know what it's called in English, but he wrote, this was a late, maybe his last book that he wrote. He writes about uh, astral voyaging. Very good. It was good for me at the time because I thought, oh my God, somebody else is experiencing, you know, have some ideas about this. Because you didn't talk about this when I grew up. No, people because call you crazy usually. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. This was a, a mental issue. So um, I was very happy to read that book, I remember. Excellent. Got one more question here, and then I'll probably start to wind her down here, if you're okay with that. Sure. So Alvacero555 asks, Stefan, if he's read an EU doc titled A Global Strategy for the European Union's Foreign and Security Policy. It lays out what the EU wants for itself in the future. Have you read that? No, I didn't read it. Okay. I'm sorry. That's quite I all right. Would, probably. Sure, I'll, I'll send it to you if you want. I can copy and paste it into a message to you later if you want. So please. Yeah, since do. I know you're interested in the EU, it's there's so much information out there to keep up with it all and still have a life is <laughs> so tough. <laughs> yeah, it is. Yeah, I, I noticed I, I tend to focus on the people yes. lately because, you know, there's so much information and uh, all these treaties and uh, documents, things. So, and I'm very interested in people and how they react, what they do, who they talk to, who they don't talk to, things like this. So uh, I tend to talk about them a lot. Um, yeah, myself as well. I, I sort of figure people like to look at, they like to zoom into certain finite ideas in politics, but at the end of the day, Politics is people. We are just a group of people that are voting, and then we have people that are representing us. They have their own ego. They have their own good and bad intentions. They have their own relationships and their own reasons. And psychology, when you look at the psychology of how people are, um, and when you've experienced a lot of self-growth or paid attention to this stuff in the past, it becomes a very different perspective of all of this, right? And for me, you always look at the individual. Like you said, you don't necessarily judge by groups. It's okay to see you know, like I can see the statistical um, reality that, say, radical Islam is far more pervasive than, say, you know, death death toll by Christian um, radical Christians. I can say that definitively, but ultimately, when I meet someone or speak about something, it comes down to the individuals. It's not about um, a group of people, right? So, yeah, I, I'm I'm with you there. I think we need that right now. With with social media, everything gets more and more polarized and people are more and more angry. Um, if you can just try to bring humanity and common sense and psychology back into it, uh, it's far more interesting. And I think it's more useful because you can start to pay attention to patterns and trends. And um, the more you understand people and how they work, the more you might kind of actually be able to predict these things, right? Yeah, I agree. So last question, I think here, um, oh, there's well, first, I'll just uh, follow up on that comment. When you um, when you read the whole document, it becomes clear the EU has ambitions for a global empire. Okay, so that's the one he was mentioning earlier. So yeah. one more question for you, Stefan, from uh, Casey Rich 13. Stefan, what is the chance of alternative for Sweden getting into parliament in the next election? What do you think? I think they have a good chance. Alternative for Sweden, that's the party that I like in Sweden. Uh, unfortunately, uh, they haven't succeeded in getting a lot of attention and media is sort of uh, 
shutting them out. So they have to work harder. I think they have an issue with uh, the chairman. I think they do. I think they, he's very good. He's intelligent and so on. But you, they need another guy, somebody with more power, more uh, charisma, maybe, you know, really a powerhouse. Because this is the one of the toughest jobs that you can find in Swedish politics to be this uh, nationalist party that want to change it all. You, you really need a very, very strong leader. And I don't think this is the guy that they have at the moment. But I, I'm rooting for them. I am a member and I follow them closely. And I think they have a good chance in the next election, not in the EU parliament election, but in the Swedish election in 2022. Well, here's hoping I'll be rooting for you from here, if it's anything like the party that I'm involved in. So, Yeah, I'm rooting for your party. Excellent. <laughs> One more quick question. Uh, BBCAD, is the UN army present in Sweden? Good question. Uh, no, it is, it is not. Uh, no. I don't know too much about this. No, Maybe no I shouldn't say anything. <laughs> but I, That's don't, quite all I right. don't think so. <laughs> All right, so um, really just the last question, I'm going to ask for a personal favor because I happen to think that the Swedish accent is pretty neat. Can you say something for us in Swedish if I if I give you a phrase? Absolutely. Can you say Maxime Bernier for Prime Minister 2019? All right. It's going to be pretty close, I think. I Maxime think so. Bernier, Maxime Bernier, uh, uh, at bli president. You say Prime Minister, Prime, Prime Minister, Minister, of course. Yes. Of course. Maxim Bernier to be uh, in Swedish. I'm sorry, I'm getting tired. Maxim <laughs> Bernier uh, for att bli Premierminister i valet uh, in, i nästa val. Excellent. And maybe one more that could be fun. How about Justin Trudeau is an absolute moron? <laughs> 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 Is there a word for moron in Swedish, Stefan? <laughs> oh, yeah, we have plenty of words. Uh, uh, Justin Trudeau are an absolute idiot. That works for me as well. I also appreciate just the corniest uh, leader around. So um, maybe that'll be the title of this of this video when I put it out. <laughs> I will leave it there. I want to thank everybody in the chat so much for your uh, lovely questions and comments. I'm um, not going to lie. I was a bit nervous at the beginning. I ha This is one of the larger chats that I've done. So I think I made some dumb geography slash muddled comments. So I apologize for that. Um, but it all picked up all is well. Thank you very much for coming on. I'll leave you with some last words. Stefan, would you like to promote your channel or if you have any message that you feel is important or on your heart that you'd like to get out right now? Well, first, I want to thank you for this opportunity. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Uh, well, I'm rooting for the Canadians, basically. And I'm hoping for these uh, strong Canadians, the women and the men of Canada, to rise up and unite to make the countries nice, good, decent, again, and sane. Yeah, that's uh, really what I wanted to say. And I want the same thing for Sweden, of course. You know, I, I have to say something because Sweden and Canada are quite similar. Uh, yes, I think we ways. get along. We should get along pretty good if we met somewhere. And um, we are about at the same, we have very similar situations, I think, in uh, Sweden and Canada. I have greater hopes for Canada because uh, you have an election soon. Yeah. And Sweden, there's a lot of work to be done here. But uh, I'm hopeful for Sweden too, of course. Well, I appreciate the support from um, across the ocean. It's always nice to speak with like-minded people. Um, I see people in the chat from Germany. There's people in England. Uh, you know, it, it's amazing to speak with people in 
you know, so many different countries that are having similar experiences and similar emotions and thoughts and just wanting to get it out. So this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing with us some of what's going on in your country, some of what's going on in your personal life, because a lot of your fans are here and it's nice to get to know these faces behind the screen a little better. Um, so I hope you'll agree to come back on eventually again here, Stefan. Absolutely. Right on. It would be a pleasure. Right on. Well, thank you again. I will uh, leave you with my usual saying, as always, be good to each other, everyone, not because the government tells you to. If you don't mind leaving a like and if you want to share, please do. And I will be uh, turning this off for live. And just to let you know, Stefan, you'll still be on the call, but we won't be live in about five seconds here. So thank you again, everyone, for coming out. And I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Take care. Thanks, Kelly.